in this room, not for you two. <laughs> okay, so welcome, welcome to the screening of Minnesota Clay. Um, I'm going to uh, talk just a little bit about uh, setting, this, setting this film up a little bit. Now, <laughs> now um, the thing about uh, Sergio Cabucci, up until a few years ago, for the most part, when people had to describe him, whether it be spaghetti western aficionados or director classifying uh, tour critics, they would probably have described Sergio Cabucci as the second best director of spaghetti westerns after Sergio Leone. Now, now while second Sergio after Leone is hardly an insult, I mean, if you think about, if you were to, uh, if one were to call, uh, say, John Ford the best director of American westerns, which I definitely do not think he is. <laughs> But if you were to say he was, then who would be the second best director of uh, American Western? Howard Hawks, Sam Peckinpah, Anthony Mann, Bud Bedecker, no disrespect. However, having said that, considering the fact that Sergio Corbucci made a spaghetti western massacre at Grand Canyon two years before Leone, made Minnesota Clay in 1964 concurrently with Sergio Leone was making Fistful of Dollars, it does seem a bit disrespectful. I feel that Sergio Corbucci is not just one of the great spaghetti western directors and one of the great Italian directors. I feel, I said, shut that shit off. You, 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 shut it off. <laughs> I feel that Sergio Corbucci is one of the great western directors of all time. And also, before Peck and Paw, he was the greatest director of action in the 60s who ever lived, cinema-wise, and violence. Now, the thing about Corbucci is his westerns fall into four periods, four categories. The first period would be his classical period, which would include uh, Massacre of Grand Canyon and Minnesota Clay. These are the films that are more influenced by the, fifth, the American Westerns of the 50s, as opposed to the Spaghetti Westerns. That's the classical period. Then there would be his Spaghetti Western period, which would start with Johnny Oro, would be Johnny Oro, would be um, uh, Django, Navajo Joe, Hellbenders, and uh, El Grande Silencio, with Johnny Oro being the kind of the bridge movie between the classical period and the Spaghetti Western period. Then there would be the uh, Mexican Revolution Trilogy, which would be uh, uh, Compañeros, Professional Gun, and What Am I Doing in the Middle of a Revolution? And then there would be his films, uh, Le Specialiste and um, uh, Sonny and Jet, which to me is this period that is the closest to the 70s counterculture western, pretty much like the hippie westerns of the 70s. You know, other American films in that vein would be The Hired Hand, Zachariah, Pat Garrett, Billy the Kid, movies like that. Now, to go to um, Minnesota Clay, though, I'm a huge, you know, as much, as much as I love the spaghetti westerns that Sergio Capucci did, I'm also a huge, huge fan 
of his classical films. I actually, I said set that off. Guys, just get the fuck out of here. Just get out of here. Just go. Go. Go, go. You're filming me. I know you're filming me. I'm not an idiot. Go, go. Be gone. Uh, now it's just us. <laughs> no, but the thing is, I'm, um, uh, the thing is, um, with, Minnesota, with Minnesota Clay, I'm a big fan of his classical western. I actually wish, but even though I wouldn't want to lose any one of the spaghetti westerns, I, I wish he had done at least two more films in the classical, in this classical, classical period, because I think of all the European directors who ever made classical westerns, he was the best. And I'm not talking about uh, the German westerns, but I'm talking about Fritz Lang, his work in Hollywood. I'm talking about Jacques Tudor's work in Hollywood. I'm talking about all of them. Uh, and Minnesota Clay is one of the best examples of that. To me, one of the things about Minnesota Clay is to me it falls exactly in line with, uh, uh, with pretty much like um, uh, the Glenn Ford, Delmer Davies westerns. They, they could totally be uh, one of the, it could totally be a Glenn Ford vehicle from about from about five or six years earlier. Now, when you say a movie is like the Glenn Ford Delmer Davies westerns, that's to me that's saying that's one of the best types of westerns of the '50s. They were some of the best of the '50s during that time. And uh, Minnesota Clay falls completely in line with that. And one of the other things that's but that's very different from Minnesota Clay again in this classical period that he did, uh, as opposed to the spaghetti westerns where he just explored the, the use of violence and explored the use of pretty much almost getting rid of the heroes. One of the things about uh, Corbucci's later films is more than any other uh, Western director along, uh, except for uh, Bud Bedecker, is this Corbucci film is defined by their villains. And Corbucci defined it himself by his villains, not by his heroes. And as time went on, he tried to eliminate the heroes as much as he possibly could, to the point that in the Hellbenders, there just there is no heroes; they're all villains. And in the course of the Gran Silencio, he disposes of the hero pretty much until he's just a costume. The, the characters are mute, the characters are blank. He casts John Louis, Louis Trintignant. The actors are blank. <laughs> so all you have is just a hat and a coat, being the you know being the hero. But in the course of Min Minnesota Clay, is the uh, the thing about Minnesota Clay is this is actually one of the few movies, except for Lee Special East, where the character actually can be described as a hero, not just an Avenger. He is a hero in this film. And uh, like for instance, there's a scene where uh, a, a runaway, a runaway buckboard goes out of control, and Minnesota Clay goes and stops it. Okay, no other Kabuchi hero would ever do anything that nice <laughs> in any other film he does. But now the thing is in. Um, so Minnesota Clay, to me, is very much steeped in, uh, in not the Italian style, but in the 50s style of American Westerns. And he, to me, he's the only European director to truly pull it off. He could have been making movies in the 50s at Warner Brothers or at Universal International. No worries. He would have been fantastic. Um, but the Italian part that comes into Minnesota Clay comes into the, the, uh, the aspect of its melodrama that is throughout the film. Now, one of the other aspects about it, and it's recorded in uh, Tim Lucas's book, All the Colors of the Dark, is while even though he doesn't get credit for it on screen, the film was uh, the cinematographer of the studio sections of Minnesota Clay was Mario Bava. Now, if you're a big Mario Bava fan, you've always been disappointed in the Westerns that Mario Bava did, that he didn't really deliver what we would want in a Mario Bava Western. And the reason is because he didn't really care for Westerns. Well, the closest thing for your imagination of what a Mario Bava Western could be is Minnesota Clay. And the last, uh, especially the last climax, the big climax, yeah, the last climax, the big climax at the end of the film feels exactly like anyone's dream of what a Mario Bava Western could be with its bloody colors, and its bloody melodrama, and its almost <coughs> Italian operatic meets Don't Cirque melodrama. It's just beautiful. And this also 
along with uh, that, is you have in this, in this movie, is the first glimpse of the great, great Sergio Capucci action. And until Peckinpah, and along with Peckinpah, nobody had directed action in cinema the way that Capucci did. The almost comic book snap, crackle, and pop of the action. The, the, almost the, uh, you know, the, the goals that, the, you know, the, the objective that Walter Hill and, Cam and, uh, and James Cameron and all those guys, you know, later reached for to try to achieve is what they, was what Corbucci brought to films. Even, even uh, directors, good directors, like Don Siegel, Robert Aldrich, look like men with lead in their shoes compared to Corbucci's action. And the first little glimpse of that, the first glimpse of that type of action is the first uh, shootout sequence. When Minnesota Clay rides up on this horse and, and kills the two guys, you'll see it has that snap. It has that snap of violence, that snap of comic book violence that hadn't really existed in the Western before. <laughs> so you have the combination of, of, uh, of, this, of, of his uh, dynamic, kinetic action combined with just this love, this love of the traditional Western. I actually do believe that Corbucci at this time never intended to make the the surreal spaghetti westerns. Leone changed the game when he came out with Fistful of Dollars. And so it was kind of, I think, the, I think more or less the rug was probably taken out from under Capucci because he wanted to make traditional westerns. He wanted to make the westerns like the ones that his heroes make, like Raoul Walsh, like the two Georges, Sherman and Marshall, uh, like, uh, uh, like Delmer Davies. He wanted to make movies like that. That was his dream when it came to doing westerns. Uh, and everything changed. And just like most of the Americans at that time, he found himself, um, basically by the time Minnesota Clay came out, it was dated, as far as you know, uh, Europe was concerned, especially, but especially but even, the, even the world. Now, who would know that the guy who actually made uh, traditional Westerns so well would dig down deep and come up with the most surrealistic Westerns, the most violent Westerns, the most nihilistic Westerns ever made. In fact, one of the things about, uh, one of the reasons that Anthony Mann has such a uh, high reputation in the world of Westerns is because of his violent sequences. You know, something like uh, in Man of the West, the homoerotic uh, humiliation of Jack Lord at the hands of uh, uh, Gary Cooper. Now, it's sequences like that that have actually helped create uh, Anthony Mann's uh, reputation. But Sergio Kabuchi has done many movies with like entire whole movies filled with sequences like that. That's just, that's du jour for a Sergio Kabuchi Western. You know, in a, in a normal Gary Cooper movie of his time or an Alan Ladd movie of his time, eight people get killed and that's a big deal. 38 people get killed in a, in a Sergio Kabuchi Western in the first half. And it's not even a, it's not even, it's not even considered a massacre. You know, a massacre is du jour in any spaghetti West, in any Sergio Capucci Western, even his first movie, it's called Massacre of Grand Canyon. So, but, but as deep and as, as nihilistic and as violent and as heartless, truly heartless, as his films would become, this is a glimpse of what would have happened if, if Sergio Leone had not taken the Western to the surrealistic way. And if he had got a chance to make Still, still violent, still rough, but uh, the more classical American style of Western that he had grown up with. Unfortunately, Minnesota plays it. <laughs> you know, it pretty much ended after Minnesota Clay. And I truly wish there was at least two more movies done in this style because I think Minnesota Clay is a classic that can stand up with any of the, the uh, Gary Cooper, Alan Ladd, or the Glenn Ford movies, or Richard Whitmark movies made during that time in the 50s. Uh, this is 64, I know. And everyone will go back. So anyway, that's, the that's my ramble on uh, Minnesota Clay. And now, without any further ado, Sergio Capucci, Cameron Mitchell, Minnesota Clay. <laughs>